Matthew 13 is where I want you to turn. And then kind of mark it or hold it there. It'll be a few moments before we get there. But when we do, I want to show you some really, really cool stuff. You know, I've, I, I've been with you for a long time. And, and so in various venues, Sunday morning, preaching and teaching, Sunday evening, ask the preacher and preaching and teaching, even in our study through the book of Revelation, which now you can go on the Internet and get the whole thing. We did that in here in the sanctuary for months, the entire book, even there. The men will know on men's Monday night Bible studies we've done this. And that is preaching and teaching and exploring the depths of the understanding of a structural element of the Word of God that changes everything when you understand it. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. I'm going to show you that again this morning. Now, what I'm speaking of is that Literally, and I'm not misusing that word literally, I mean literally from Genesis, Genesis into Revelation, all of it is wrapped around the skeleton, the biblical skeleton of the seven feasts of the Lord. All of it, literally from Genesis to Revelation. It was done that way on purpose. That's why God's people were commanded, you celebrate these feasts first in an agricultural, agrarian style of thousands of years ago, but pay attention to the offerings and the sacrifices and the methodology of how you pull those off and how you do those and what the high priest does, the great high priest, and what happens in the temple or the tabernacle it started as. And Pay attention to all of that down through the years because ultimately it will all come together and explode into a revelation of the Messiah you were looking for. And it will explode again when he returns. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has eyes to see, let him see. Sadly, so much of today's church not only doesn't see it or hear it, but they don't want to see it or hear it. You can get all over the internet and listen to preachers talking about, we don't need that Old Testament stuff. We don't need all that Jewish stuff. Those very words came from Constantine, from the Nicene Council. I've actually read those words from this pulpit on a Sunday morning. I did it again sometime later on a Sunday night in a Sunday night Bible study. I did it again on a Wednesday night when Pastor Greg couldn't be here, who usually preaches on Wednesday nights, and that was my theme. I actually brought the document where the Emperor Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who basically captured and took possession and hold of the early Christian church and literally said... We don't need that Jewish stuff anymore. He said, we're not going to celebrate those feasts. That's for the Jews. Problem is, the Word of God doesn't say it's the feasts of the Jews. It says it's the feasts of the Lord. And they all point to the coming Messiah who is for Jew and Gentile. Jew first because God chose them to bring the whole thing. But Gentiles right there with them. Until he comes in the flesh, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And until he births the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, under the same blood of the same lamb. The one new man, Paul calls it in Ephesians chapter 2. The seven feasts of the Lord. Now, this message is not about the seven feasts per se. I'm not going to go through each one. I've done that many times. I've written about it. I've done a lot of interviews on it. I'll probably preach and teach on it some more as we are together if the Lord tarries. But I wanted to point that out because once you understand the truth of this, and so much of the church does it because they miss it totally. It's just either not taught, it's not preached, it's not, it's not emphasized, and it should be emphasized. 
I mean, last week was the Feast of Pentecost. Well, that's when the church was born. You reckon we ought to emphasize that? We, you reckon we ought to point out the fulfillment of that and what was done in the earliest days for 1,500 years and the celebration of it and then how, boom, it exploded into flesh and blood like the Word became flesh. The Word who was God became flesh and dwelt among us. So did the Word about the coming together of Jew and Gentile under the blood of the Lamb. In Pentecost, at the Feast of Pentecost, the church was born. We talked about that last week because last week was the celebration of Pentecost. Mm. The Feast of the Lord, the seven feasts of the Lord. Very quickly, you remember last week we learned some amazing things right out of the Word and right out of history about that, that monumental explosion of the giving of the Holy Spirit, the birthing of the church, the first preaching of the gospel by the early church, 3,000 people saved, and how that connected all the way back to the original Passover found in Exodus 12, and, and then later at the foot of Mount Sinai, and Exodus 18, 19, and 20. And then Numbers 5, let me remind you what I'm talking about very quickly. Exodus 12, it talks about the coming out under the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, and taking the blood and putting it at the top of the doorpost and putting it on the side of the lintel and the doorpost and the shape of a cross <laughs> and coming through the door and getting under the blood of the lamb that would be taken inside and sacrificed. And then those people who were under the lamb would come out of Egypt and out of slavery. You see all the symbolism. I mean, all this stuff really happened. It was a real event with real people, a real Egyptian empire and real slaves, Hebrew slaves for 400 years. And they really came out and they really were backed up against the Red Sea. And they really did spend 40 years in the wilderness. And they really did defeat every enemy that came out to try to conquer them. And they really did cross the Jordan eventually. And they really did go into the promised land. And they really did defeat Jericho and Ai and all of those places and they really did take possession of and they really did become a nation and the 12 tribes really did settle but all of that not only did it really happen but every bit of it was a message from the throne of God every bit of it was a word every bit of it was a sermon metaphors, pictures of the ultimate fulfillment it would all take place in Jesus Christ and in the birth of the church and then of the coming again and of the setting up of his kingdom. Amen, church? And it all started with the first feast of the Lord. How can we ignore that? How can we throw that away? How can you say that's that Jewish stuff? And then you almost spit when you say the word Jewish. How horrible is that before the throne of God? How horrible. Yet Christian denominations have gotten caught up in this all over the world for decades. It's not a new thing, but and it all started right about the time of Constantine. There were some horrible things going on in Rome during that time. Christians thrown to the lions, all kind of stuff. And he put a stop to that, and so people were glad of that. They kind of did anything he said for a while, and a lot of what he said was purely heretical. And to this day, a lot of that heresy still is embedded in the church all over the world because it's now become tradition. And so people think it's in the word of God. And I have people argue with me. Sometimes they get on the internet, you know that so-and-so and so-and-so. And I'll say, really show me that in the word. All of a sudden they go dark. Well, so-and-so said, I didn't say that. Show me the scripture in the word, in context. Well, where did it come from? Tradition. Are you following me? So this is why it's important to know the skeleton that holds the whole word of God up. The seven feasts of the Lord. Well, I've taught on all that before, and I'm not going to do it again. I want to keep going forward because I want to show you something else this morning. But let me just remind you, these things I'm going to remind you of... You're going to see again more illustrations right there in scriptures that you're going to say, I never knew that was about that. Well, you do now. You will in just a moment. And that's the point I'm making, that once you see this stuff, once you understand it, you can't unsee it. It's everywhere. 
And what I love about it is, and you're going to see this in a moment, that you're going to see these truths. You're going to see these PowerPoints that God makes, and there's no explanation around them like now. Now, now listen, this is connected to this, and this goes back to this, and see how this became this. It's just there for us to discover. And they're there by the dozens and dozens and dozens. And they've been there for thousands and thousands of years for us to discover and for us to go, oh my gosh. And there's no other book in the world that does anything like this. Because this is the living Dabar, Hebrew, the living word, the word. When God speaks a word and it happens. God said, let there be light. And 10,000 years later, somebody constructed a machine and made some. No, let there be light. And there was light. You follow me? All right. So one of the things that we've learned together the last several weeks, we've talked about the whole concept of the one new man and how Paul writes about it. half the New Testament he writes. And, and over and over he's talking about the one new man, the Jew and the Gentile under the blood of Jesus, how we are. We are, literally it says in the English, the temple of God over and over and over. It's interesting because the Greek word there, most of you will remember, you don't have to remember all these Greek and Hebrew words, but listen to the concepts. The Greek word there is naos, which means the holy place, the holy of holies behind the veil. The, the Greek word for the whole big temple itself is called the he -aran. It doesn't say you are the holy he -aran of God, the holy temple of God. It says you are the holy of holies of God. You are the temple of God. Do you not know this? Your body is a naos. It is the naos of God. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. Does all this make sense? You remember this? So we've learned about all of that. We also learned in the Old Testament, those words, he, Iran, and naos, have synonyms in the Hebrew. Hekal for he, Iran, and Mikdash for naos. That is the building, Hekal, and then the Holy of Holies, the Mikdash. But then we learned about this really cool nickname of that Holy of Holies place. Really cool. And because it all comes to fruition in the New Testament, that's why it's cool to us. And it comes from the Hebrew word Dabar, D-A-B-A-R, in the, in the Hebrew dictionary written in English. <laughs> D Dabar, Dabar. But but the word is the bear, the, the bear, the bear. And, and it's a variation of the word dabar because what it means is dabar means the word that's spoken. And when it's spoken by God, it happens. Now, when we speak the word, the supernatural, the holy word, the powerful word, the word filled with power as God's people, we live in a fallen world. So it doesn't, oh, I mean, I, I can't just speak it and it's going to happen, but I can speak Encouragement. I can speak the word. I can speak salvation. I can speak in, in healing. I can speak deliverance. I can speak these things. And God often honors it, but a lot of it has to do with people's response to it, too. We live in a fallen world. That's why Jesus always spoke about having the faith, listening. Do you have the ears to he hear? Do you have the eyes to see? Then we will speak that word and it will happen. That's important, but they bear. That is used. 16 times in the Old Testament. I've already talked about this, but I'm just reminding you so we can go forward. It's 16 times in the Old Testament, and it speaks, it just doesn't show up in your English translations, but it will say, but the word is there, but it will say, um, uh, somebody will say, I'm, I'm going up to the, in, in the English, it'll say, to the holy place in the temple, or I'm going up to the temple, or to the holy of holies. But in the Hebrew, it says, Deber which translates to the holy word place, the place where God's word is. What was behind that veil? The Ark of the Covenant containing, now watch this, the Ten Commandments as a symbol of the whole word of God, Aaron's rod as a symbol of the high priesthood that would effect that word. But watch, once a year, the high priest went into the Deber, 
to the holy word place. But he had to be cleansed himself, and he had to have the blood of the lambs with him, the sacrificial lambs, and he sprinkled it on the ark. What's the symbolism there? The blood of the lamb is even over everything that's in that ark. The blood of the lamb is the ultimate fulfillment of the word, the high priesthood, everything. Here's the human high priest sprinkling the sacrificial blood of the lamb over the ark, which contains the word of God, which served God's people well for 1,500 years, and over the high priesthood. Then the high priest comes out and he speaks what God has put upon his heart to the people. Why? Because he just came out of the holy word place that was under the blood of the lamb. Does all that symbolism make sense? Okay. That's what it was always about. Last week was Pentecost. I told you about the different things that happened and how it all ties back to the Old Testament and Exodus 12, it talks about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. But it also says, and the mixed multitudes with them. Those were Gentiles. Whenever you hear the word Gentile or nations, that means everybody that's not a Hebrew person. Everybody that's not a Jewish person. So, since it all came through the Jews, and since God chose the Jews to bring the word of God, the prophecies of God, the prophets of God, even the Messiah of God, the church was born through all of that. God chose them. They are special in his sight, of course. And much of the Old Testament is about their journey. But the whole way, beginning with coming out of Egypt in Exodus 12, it says there were 600,000 Jewish men. And when you add the women and children, now you're well over a million. And the mixed multitude of the nations came with them. They also were under the blood. They also believed God. They believed the witness of their Jewish friends and fellow slaves. They too went through the door into those homes. They too had the blood of the lamb sprinkled in the shape of a cross of all things. And they went through it. They too were saved. And then you get to Numbers chapter 5 when they're in the wilderness. They've got their tabernacle and they're doing the sacrifices. And God tells the Jewish people, now listen, when you're doing these sacrifices, the nations that are with you must do the same ones in order to receive the same blessings and the same forgiveness. Jew and Gentile were together in that throng in the wilderness for 40 years. It was a picture of what was going to come in the church. Here we are, Jew and Gentile, together under the blood of the Lamb, the word that became flesh. Is everybody with me? Here we are in a wilderness journey. Have you all noticed? Have you noticed a crazy world out there? Have you heard the beast roaring? <laughs> Have you seen the depravity of mind? Have you heard and seen the nations that want to come against God's people? It's the wilderness journey all over again, but now it's in the flesh. Now it's getting close to the return of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. But it's all happening again now in greater fulfillment, and here we are. That's why half of the New Testament proclaims, don't you know that you, Jew and Gentile, under the blood of Lamb, you are now the holy word place of God. From here comes the holy word. From here comes the holy word. From your mouths come the holy word. From we together as a body comes the Holy Word. We are the ones proclaiming Jesus. We are the ones exalting the Lord. We are the ones lifting up the Word. We are the ones that are learning the Word and then teaching it where it's you know appropriate and where people ask us to and where we're allowed. We teach that Word. We share that Word. We preach that Word. We minister that Word. We are the ones going into hospitals and praying with people. We are the ones... Are you following me? Why? New Testament tells us. We don't need a temple on the Temple Mount anymore. All that's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. If we had a temple on the Temple Mount, then they would be doing blood sacrifices again, and, and the Jewish people wouldn't even think about coming to Jesus Christ. And we've got our sacrifices back. We've got our temple back. Now, that's why Paul said, don't you know you are now the temple? You are the Deber. You are the Naos. You are the holy word place, Jew and Gentile, under the blood, the one new man in Jesus Christ. 
Everybody got that? I, I know some of you are saying, we heard all this last week and the week before. I know, but I can ask you about it three months from now and you won't remember any of it. Which is why I repeat it over and over. Why? Because it's the skeleton. You're going to see again. I'm going to show you cool stuff. And it's not just so you can win games of Bible trivia. I'm going to show you cool stuff because you're going to go, oh my gosh. I did. I've read that a million times. I had no idea connected to this, but now I see it. That's why I'm saying, once you see this, this what? What I'm telling you right now, all of this, and what I've been telling you for the last several weeks especially. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. But first you have to see it. It has to come here, has to go here, has to go here. It comes through here, and it goes here. And sadly, all over the world, with many who claim to be Christians, and I do not judge their salvation. God says, don't do that. I'll handle that in the last days. I'll show you that in a minute. But sadly, so many who claim to be Christians, what I'm speaking right now is gibberish to them. They don't have a clue. And it's the skeleton of everything. It's like you. you you're like, who's that up there preaching? Well, that's old Carl. Okay, and when you say that, you get a picture in your mind of Carl. <laughs> Please be sweet. <laughs> I mean, I get a picture when I look in the mirror. Dad, what are you doing in my bathroom? I... <laughs> so, but when I say you get a picture of Carl, this is what I'm talking about. You don't in your mind ever, ever think or see my skeleton. Do you? But if I didn't have a skeleton, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'd be just piled up on the floor and wouldn't live long. The skeleton is behind the scenes, but it's wrapped up in the flesh. But the skeleton holds everything together. It holds the skull up, which holds the brain. Be nice. <laughs> it mobilates me. I can walk because I've got a skeleton that's working and moving. Are you following me? The seven feasts of the Lord, that's what that is. From Genesis to Revelation, they're expounded upon and shown you slowly over time how they become fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and in the church itself. And when I say church, I'm not talking denominations or buildings. I'm talking about born-again people, the ecclesia in Greek, the called-out ones. Anytime you see the word church in the New Testament, underneath it in the Greek is the word ecclesia. There's nothing about a building. It's about the called out ones gathered together, ministering. Why? Because we are now the Deber, the Deber. We are now the holy word place of God, the temple, most English translations will say. Are you all with me? Pentecost, last week. So I told you a lot of cool things. Here's something else. I've preached this before, but I didn't last week. But I want to hit this because we're going to move on and it's all going to carry over. I told you about on Pentecost how the Orthodox Jews today from tradition, but they get it from Scripture, and there's a place where it, I, I, I can see where they get it. So I'm not disparaging them at all for this, but they believe that, that Israel was born at the foot of Mount Sinai at the giving of the law on Pentecost. Now, they didn't even know about the celebration of Pentecost as one of the feasts of the Lord at that time, but they can go back and look now and see when they arrived at Sinai in reference to when Pen uh, Passover was. And then Leviticus 23 tells you how many weeks you actually count down till Pentecost. And sure enough, there's a passage that says three months after they left on Passover, they were at the foot of Sinai. That's right about at Pentecost. It's right there in the scriptures. Now, it doesn't say Pentecost, but you measure it out, and that's about right when it was, if not exactly. So to this day, the Orthodox Jews at Pentecost, that's one of the things they celebrate. They also read the book of Esther. You remember? You remember why? See, it's been one week. See, that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm having fun with you. I don't want to retell the whole thing, but basically it took place at the wheat harvest, that whole story of the book of Esther. 
uh, uh, excuse me, Ruth, 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 Ruth. The whole play, the whole thing took place at the, in of uh, the book of Ruth at, at Pentecost. Remember Boaz and Ruth, and okay, it was a Pentecost. It was the wheat harvest. Remember that? Okay. Remember we found Ruth's name in the genealogy of Jesus. We found out that Ruth and Boaz were the great grandparents of King David. Remember that? And so the Orthodox Jews to this day, they celebrate that. They celebrate the harvest. They celebrate the birth of the original nation of Israel at the giving of the law. They celebrate the book of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer, Boaz. It's another name for Yeshua. He is the redeemer. I mean, it's right there in the Old Testament. But a lot of the Orthodox bless their hearts. They don't have eyes to see. It's just, it's just totally obscure to them. This is the heartbreak of the whole thing. But you know what else happens among the Orthodox or what happened when they had a temple and a high priest? According to Leviticus 23, where the seven feasts are laid out, the seven feasts of the Lord are laid out. One of the things they were to do at the celebration of Pentecost, Shavuot in Hebrew, is that the great high priest, watch this, would take two loaves of break, baked bread, each of them containing leaven. Throughout the Word of God, Old and New Testament, Leaven is always used as a symbol of sin. And as a matter of fact, it is defined that way in both the Old and New Testament in certain passages. It's always used as a symbol of sin. And some people would say, well, except this place in Leviticus 23 where it tells the priest to do that. You take the, the bread. This time you, you've, you make it with leaven because it's so sweet and it's tastier that way. The problem with leaven, though, is, is it makes it sweet and tasty. It rises quick, but it rots quicker. It spoils quicker. That's why the Jews were told to take unleavened bread into the wilderness. That's why Jesus is called our unleavened bread. He is bread. He put on flesh. Bread represents human flesh. Remember at the Passover, this bread represents my body. Remember? But unleavened bread represents human flesh without sin. Well, there's only one who's ever lived that. That's why the New Testament calls Yeshua our unleavened bread. He is the feast of unleavened bread. He fulfills that. He is the only sinless one. Is everybody with me? But the original high priest, and for a thousand years or more, the Orthodox would celebrate it this way. The original high priest would take the two loaves and pretend like one's over here. Okay. Would take the two loaves, baked, baked with leaven, and would do what was called a wave offering. I'll explain that and I'll demonstrate a little bit of it here in a moment. But not only the two loaves, but also two perfect male lambs. And he would take the loaves with Leaven in them still means sin. And he would offer it to the Lord during the feast. And here's what he would do. He would take the loaves. Pretend like you see this one over here. <laughs> okay. He would take the loaves. And he would lift them up. And then he would wave them back and forth. That's why it's called a wave offering. Then bring them to his chest and then open them back up. What is this a picture of? The high priest. With a loaf of bread in each hand with sin. You get to the New Testament. Never is this explained. You just know it if you know the skeleton is there. Paul says, don't you know, Jew and Gentile, filled with sin, both of them, but under the blood, lifted up to God. That high priest took those two little lambs, 
lifted them up, waved them, brought them back, <laughs> and put them out. He is acting out and doesn't even know it. The blood of the Lamb is offered for the Jew with all of their sin. The blood of the Lamb is offered for the Gentile with all of their sin. And the great high priest is Jesus himself. Offering it up before the throne of God. And the church is born. Jew and Gentile. When was the church born? When that celebration was done at Pentecost. Are you all following me? And when the church is born, what's it called? Don't you know that you are now the day bear, the day bear of God? You speak the debar. <laughs> well, when God speaks it, it happens. That's when. That's like when, when Jesus walked up to a demon possessed man and says, "Come out of him." Ah, they were gone. Amen. The holy debar was spoken by the. Yahweh in the flesh, the Debar that became flesh and dwelt among us. That's why the Pharisees went to him and said, you must have a demon in you. How can you do this? By what name are you driving out these demons? <laughs> he said, you don't, know. you don't know because you don't know my father who sent me. We know the father. No, your father is the devil. That, that's what Jesus said. I love it when people say, Preacher, you need to be more like Jesus. Thank you. Somebody bring me rope and I'll make a whip. <laughs> I, I, I'm just telling you. All of this is all through the Word of God. Watch. We're going to get to Matthew 13. Just a second. Can't wait to show it to you. So at Pentecost, just last week, Israel was born. It all, is, it, it, it all moves forward to the book of Ruth and the kinsman redeemer and the great grandparents of David and the genealogy of Jesus. It all moves there. The high priest for a thousand years. <laughs> Way of offering. The bread made from the wheat. Leaven was put in that bread, though, because a picture is being painted. To this day, the Orthodox try to explain it, you know, and they never really explain it about sin. And a lot of Christian denominations, they'll go to that. And they say, well, in this case, it doesn't represent sin. Excuse me, every other place in the Bible it does. And there are two places in the Word of God where it literally says the leaven represents the sin. More than two places, several places in the New Testament. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember? for example, in other places. No, it represents sin. What's happening? The great high priest is lifting up two bodies. Who are they? Jew and Gentile, filled with sin, but lifting them up to the Lord. Under the great high priest, they are now blessed offerings before God. All of that is happening. Now we get to the New Testament. Go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13 starts in Matthew 11 and Matthew 12. Don't worry about that right now. I want to set up this context. Matthew 11 and 12. And it's early in Jesus' ministry during the first year. He's down in the Capernaum, Lake Galilee area most of the time. Once he goes up to Jerusalem, but he comes back. Now, it's early in the first year, and he and the disciples are walking through the grain fields right outside of Capernaum. And they're, they're shucking the grain, and they're eating it for their breakfast. More than likely, this is happening at more than likely around Pentecost. Bible doesn't say that, but it does say they're in the grain fields and they're rubbing the grain and eating it. Gives a whole different meaning to the term Wheaties for breakfast, doesn't it? <laughs> they were having their Wheaties. The Pharisees came up, you're doing work! 
You're doing work, you're breaking the Sabbath, and you're teaching your disciples. Who gives you this authority? I mean, he was constantly just dogged. And what did he say to them? He said, one greater than the Sabbath is here. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. A little bit later on in that day, they wound up in the synagogue. There was a man with a withered hand. Those of you that are students of the Word, you'll remember this. If you're not, you're newer to the Word, I'm not talking down to you. I'm just trying to give you some context here. It was against the law of the rabbis to heal on the Sabbath. So Jesus is in the synagogue, and he sees a man whose hand is withered and gnarled, which means he can't work. In that day, guys, they didn't have computers and tech jobs. It was in the fields, and it was making stuff with your hands, tents and wagons and shoes and clothing and planting crops. And if you had a withered hand, you could be really poor really quickly. Jesus walks over to him, tells him to stretch out his hand. The Pharisees are furious. He's going to heal on the Sabbath, and the man stretches out his hand. Everybody knew the man. They've just come to know Jesus in the last year. But the man, they've known him forever. He stretches out his hand, and as he does, it unravels, and the man hits his knees and weeps like a child. His life has just been given back to him. Almost a riot ensues. You can read it in the scriptures. And then they finally make their way outside. And the Pharisees are already plotting to kill him. You know what that's called? <laughs> murder. Thou shalt not commit murder. One of the Ten Commandments, they're plotting as a group for somebody who's just healed a man and gave him his life back. You'd think they would have said, how the heck do you do that? Praise God. Maybe you are the Messiah. Sit down with us today and tell us more. No, nah, no. Nah. We need to kill him. He's going to draw bigger crowds at his church than we got at ours. They'll get bigger offerings. That's why we tell our guests, don't put your money in the offering plate. This is not about that. I've had several people tell me that visit. They say, this is the first church I've ever been where the preacher gets up and says, don't put any money in the offering plate. Everybody knows what I mean by that in context. Put it in there if God's told you to. Don't put it in there if you think you need it more than he does. That's between you and the Lord. Because this is not about getting money and seeing if we're bigger than some other church. Or It's not about that. We can have 10,000 people here, and it doesn't mean everybody here is saved. And, I mean, it's not about that. This is what Jesus is trying to tell them. So they go out. Well, the rest of the day he's out, and the crowds are following him. The Pharisees try to trap him and set him up. They bring demon-possessed men, people before him because they know who the demon-possessed are because they can't run the demons out. They come up to Jesus, and Jesus is speaking the Debar. The holy word that brings things to pass. And he's telling them, get out, leave, shut up, go. Boom. And the people are healed in front. The crowds are going crazy. All of this goes on all day. He heals a few sick people. Listen, he doesn't drive out every demon-possessed person in the world. He doesn't heal every sick person in the world. What's he doing? He's showing those with eyes to see and ears to hear who he is. This is the Debar who has become flesh and is now among you. The one who said, let there be light, and there was light. Now you're looking at him in the flesh. Everything before that is being fulfilled in this man. And he's not really man. He's all man, but he's all God at the same time. God has visited his creation, and he's trying to show them. And so they celebrate. 
No, they plot his murder. Is everybody with me? All that's happening. Then it comes nighttime or afternoon, late afternoon. I'm not going to read all of chapter 13. We're going to skip around in it a little bit, but I can tell you this. There are seven parables he tells from a boat on the lakeside down by Lake Galilee. He has to do that because crowds are so huge. He has to get out away from them where they can't close in on him, where his voice will travel. So they, Peter and those guys have a boat and they put him on the boat, put him on the bow. He stands up. That's his pulpit. It's like, here's the shoreline. Here are the crowds. Please, I'm not saying I'm Jesus, but pretend like I'm representing him. And he's, sta- and he's standing up on the bow and he's speaking to the crowds. And now they can hear him. Does that make sense? So that's the picture. He gives seven parables of the kingdom. I'm going to show you two. And then a conclusion he makes. Remember how I started this sermon. Once you see this, you will never, ever be able to unsee it again. Remember more than likely the approximate time all of this is taking place. Probably near Pentecost. He's going through the grain fields with his disciples, eating Wheaties. Remember that. Remember that it's only in the first year of his ministry. He has yet to go to the cross. He has yet to rise from the grave. He has yet to birth the church with the Holy Spirit. Remember all that. I'm going to show you something. For those of you that are students of the word, you've seen it a thousand times. Today, you'll see it a little deeper, and then you will realize that when I say, once you understand these elements of the seven feasts of the Lord, and the Hekal, and the Mikdash, and the Deber, and the Hiran, and the Naos, and its synonym, the Deber, its synonym in Hebrew, from the Greek. Once you understand those things, whether you remember those words or not, you understand the concepts. And then you remember that Paul said it's Jew and Gentile under the same blood. It's the sinful Jew and the sinful Gentile lifted up to God by the great high priest under the same blood of the lamb that is lifted up. Once you understand all that, you'll never see this the same again. Look at Matthew 13, beginning with verse 1. That same day, I've already told you about the day. From the grain fields to the synagogue to the demons to the healing. That same day, Jesus went out of the house. He was at Peter's house. They went out and they sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, here's the first one. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some of the seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. He's going to tell you who the birds are in a moment. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, weeds, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell. Notice it's a crop. More than likely he's talking about a wheat crop with weeds. In fact, we know that from another parable. That's exactly what he's talking about. This is happening at around Pentecost. He tells a parable that matches what they're going through. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Now come down to verse 18. Later, he's with the disciples. They've asked him, what the, heck, what the heck did that mean? He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which will be born in the church and which will come again in the last days. When anyone hears the message about all that and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. What was it he used as an illustration? The birds of the air, demons, hordes of them, moving in and amongst Places wherever the word is preached or taught. I'm so glad none of that happens today, aren't y'all? See, you're wondering, what's going on with the world? 
We don't know what a marriage is. We don't know what a gender is. We don't know what a woman is. We don't know what a man is. We don't know what a little boy is. We don't know what a little girl is. We don't know what we ought to do with and to little boys and little girls. We don't know. It's because the demonic horde has been poured out over this planet. And they're chipping away at the seats of the word that is coming from the holy word place. The word is being sown, hopefully. A whole lot of people who are in pulpits who should be sowing the word of what a marriage is, what a man is, what a woman is, they won't because they're afraid of the world. Listen to this. It's going to get a whole lot better, I promise you. Hang on. So look at verse 21. But since he has no root... He lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word. Look, look, look back up at verse, um, verse uh, 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 10. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky place is the man who hears the word and at once receives it. You're going to hear the word, word, several times in this parable. He's explaining what it was about the sower. You know what that word is in Greek? Logos. You know what its synonym is in Hebrew? The bar, the anointed word, the holy word, the word, when it is spoken, it can create something. That's the word that's used here, logos. The synonym to the one that's distributing it would be the deber. Don't you know you are the deber? The holy word place of God? What are you doing? You're speaking the holy debar, the word. But what's happening? Well, the demonic has out there. It, it's been outpoured. The word's being snatched away in a lot of people's hearts and lives and families and marriages and pulpits and churches and nations and schools and governments. It's being snatched away. Now, verse 12, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorn is the man who hears the logos in Greek, the dabar in Hebrew. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man or woman, of course, the person who hears the dabar and understands it. And that one produces a crop. This is a metaphor. Yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what is sown. In other words, not everybody who just says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, Brother Carl, I believe the word of God. I believe the Bible's the word of God. You know what I'm going to say next now, right? So does Satan. I believe Jesus died for our sins. So does Satan. He hates it, but he knows it, and he believes it. He was there, by the way. I believe he rose from the grave. There you go. I got it. I believe Jesus rose from the grave. Okay, so you said it with your mouth. You believe it in your head because you read it on paper, but do you believe it in your heart, which means you're ready to live it? Because you see, Satan can say the same thing. But he will not bow his knee, move it to his heart, and live it. You are Lord. You were raised from the dead for me. He won't do it. Parable of the sower. is t He sets up these parables. Probably during Pentecost. It's all about the wheat planting. And it's about casting the seed. And the seed, he says, I'm explaining it to you, is the Dabar, the Logos. It takes root when someone's willing to hear it and see it and believe it. Some people will say they do, but then the government issues an executive order. Then the government tells the church what to do. Then the government tells the church what it can sing and what it can't sing. And people go, ah, 
whatever the government says. And the birds snatch away the word and the power. Are y'all following me? All right, now, now. So there's a little taste of once you see it, you can't unsee it. This revolves around the feast. It's there. It's everywhere. The feast of the Lord is the skeleton to the whole word of God. But it doesn't explain it there, does it? It doesn't say, now, now this is a, a metaphor. This is a parable of the Feast of Pentecost. It just, it just tells you, and if you have studied to show yourself approved, a workman able to accurately handle the Word of God, you'll see it. And then you cannot unsee it. And from this point forward, you'll see it again and again and again, and you cannot unsee it. And then you will know this is the Debar of God. This is the word that became flesh. And now his word says, don't you know that you are the Debar of God? You're the place where his word resides through his Holy Spirit. You are the Debar. You are the temple. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. Now get out there. And speak the word. Everybody with me? All right, but watch. He tells another. He tells seven parables here. But let me just jump to this. Look at verse 24. Now, then Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed. Here we go again. Gee, what do you reckon this is? In his field. But while everyone was sleeping. Remember what Paul tells us? He said, don't be asleep. You're not, you're not in darkness. You're supposed to be in light. You're not, you should not be asleep. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy, the farmer's enemy, well, the, the farmer is the Lord. You know that. The enemy is Satan. He came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Can't unsee it now, can you? The answer is no, Carl. We can't unsee it. Pentecost. And went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Now, see, this is some translations say tares. That's because the tear, the plant called known as the tear, looks just like a stalk of wheat. The difference is it produces no kernels, produces no fruit, and it sucks the nutrients out of the ground around the wheat. Wow, this is a good illustration. It's almost like he's God or something. He said, so the farmer's sowing wheat seeds. The enemy is sowing tear seeds. Verse 27. The owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed, good wheat in your field? Where then did these tares come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, you want us to go out and pull all of them up? <laughs> That's called an inquisition. No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you might root up some of the wheat with them. There's a boy, there's a teaching there. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, the tares, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn or into my father's house. Go to verse. Uh, go to verse thirty-six. Then Jesus left the crowd. He went into the house where they were. His disciples came to him and said, "Please explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field, the tares in the wheat field." Jesus answered, "The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man." The field is the world. That would be Jew and Gentile, right? Somebody please talk to me. Thank you. The field is the world. It would be Jew and Gentile. And the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. That word son means children, men and women. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Now, we're going to keep reading, but look at me for a moment. Do you understand that he's telling these in his first year? 
he is already prophesying of his coming again. But he's also prophesying of the birth of the church. If you know what you're looking for, the Feast of Pentecost. What does it celebrate? The wheat harvest. What's this parable about? The wheat harvest. And the workers come and say, what about all these tares out here? Do, do you see it? What does Jesus liken it to? The end of the age. He says, I know who's who. I know the hearts and heart, the hearts here. I know the hearts and the minds of everyone. I will separate them out in judgment. Now, we know, learn from the rest of the scripture, the church has to do its due diligence. In other words, we're not going to let people come in here and say, we don't believe the Bible's the word of God. We don't believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. Now, make me a teacher and make me a deacon and preacher, get out of the pulpit. I'm preaching Sunday. That ain't happening here. Okay? But it doesn't mean I'm judging their salvation. That's between them and the Lord. I would probably say they're not saved. But... I'm not going to say, you know what? You're going to burn in hell for all that. I'm just going to say, brother, you need to let us talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. All right, well, then hit those doors because you're not bringing that garbage in here. I mean, there's a way to do it, guys. And that's what the scripture is saying here. That's what Jesus is telling the disciples. Use your head. Be smarter. Okay? He says, you don't know the hearts and minds. You don't know the souls. I do. The, the Lord of the harvest, he'll, I'll take care of all that. I promise you. Me, my angels, we know who's who and what's up. And what's what? But in the meantime, he said, this is at the end of the age. Keep going. I, did I lose my place here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Then he says, verse 40, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin. Remember, the church hadn't even been born yet. He's already talking about all of this in the end of the age. And all who do evil, then they will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Guys, I know this has been lengthy. I went back and covered some material I've already covered before, but I'm trying to pull it all together right into this season here so that we know, you know, I know, we know, and you know, and you remember, and I remember, and we all remember who we are. We are the holy word place of God. We are the ones that plant the seed. The seed comes from heaven. It's the word of God. It's the logos. It is the dabar. It's the word that has power in it. It's divine. But we are the deber. We are the holy word place now. We are now the holy of holies. We are the priests, not the great high priest. That's Jesus. But we're priests. We're ambassadors of his kingdom. He's the great high priest. He's the one that holds up the offering. It's his blood, not the blood of lamb, literal lambs. Now, he is the lamb of God. Amen? Amen. And he's the one that holds up the, the bread uh, of the Jew with sin in it and the bread of the Gentile with sin in it. That's why we come to the Lord's table. He takes that bread and says, this is my body. What is it? It's unleavened bread that I will break for you. Every time you eat it, you remember what I did for you, the sinless one. I shouldn't go to that cross. You should go to this cross. But I'm going to go for you. And you remember this every time you take the Lord's Supper. Is everybody with me? It's all there. Once you see it, you can't unsee it anymore. It's all right there. Now, I started this message by giving a little challenge. I want to show you where I got it from. It's right here in Matthew 13. Look at verse 52. This is how he ends all of his teaching on all of the parables. He said to them, Therefore, different translations has this next little two or three or four words translated differently. I'm going to read it as I have it here, but I'm going to explain to you what it is in the Greek literally, and it's powerful. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of its storeroom new treasures as well as the old some translations will say every scribe who teaches the law. The word scribe is not there. The word, the word law is not even there. It, but the phrase that's in the Greek is, is every, everyone who is instructed in the word, who's discipled in the word, everyone who receives it and sees it, 
they are like somebody who has gone into a house and found treasures. But they bring it outside for everybody to see it, both the old and the new. See, that's what we do here a lot. We go to the Old Testament, we go to the New Testament. Or we start in the New Testament and we connect it to the Old Testament. What are we doing? We're going inside the house of God, if you will. And we're looking in his word. Because we are the holy word place. And we're making the connections. And then we begin to see, oh my gosh. There's nothing else like this. There's nothing like this in the Quran. Nothing like this in the Hindu Vedas. Nothing like this in the teachings of Buddha. Nothing like this in Nostradamus. Nothing like this in the, in the astrology charts of your, on the internet. There, there's nothing like this anywhere with all of these intricate, interwoven connections. 66 books written by 45 authors over a 1,500-year period. Most of them didn't even know each other. And then you get to the New Testament and you see all this revelation. Once you understand what's in the old, now you can bring out the old, connect it to the new and say, Oh my gosh, Yeshua HaMashiach, he is the Christ, he is the Lord, he is the Savior. He's fulfilled all the feasts, he's fulfilled everything. And he's fulfilled the role of the great high priest and he's still fulfilling it and going to fulfill it when he returns. And the kingdom is coming, he will return because before he even, before he even went to the cross, he was already talking about it, connecting it to all of the feasts. And then they continued to live themselves out right till he delivered himself to the cross and became our Passover lamb, the first feast. Amen. As the, give the Lord a hand. As the unleavened bread, the flesh without sin. And then a few days later, on the feast of first fruits, he rose from the grave and became our first fruits. And then seven weeks later, he gave the Holy Spirit and birthed the church at Pentecost and became the great high priest who held up the left, the Jew, and the Gentile and presented it to God in the shape of a cross. And he says, they're good because they're with me. They're good. They're under the blood. Amen. The Feast of Trumpets. We're already trumpeting the word of God all over the world. The world ignores it just like the world ignores the trumpets. The Feast of Atonement, that day's coming. That's when the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the world. If you're not under the blood, if the high priest, if you've not come before the high priest, if you've not, if he's not done it correctly, if you're not under the blood of the lamb, then God's wrath is on you. The Feast of Tabernacles. That's the last of the seven ones. You know how the book of Revelation ends? Chapter 21 and 22. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now among his people. And he will be with them. And they will be with him. And he will wipe every tear from their eye. And there will be no more mourning or death or pain because all things have been made new. And he will tabernacle with them and they will tabernacle with him. From Genesis to Revelation, it's the skeleton that holds it all together. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. I just showed you two or three things here this morning. The scriptures are filled with these pictures with no explanation. The explanation is the word, but the word has to be in your heart. And then you're prepared to be the deber, the holy word place. You're like the one that's been discipled in the word. And now you take the old and the new. You bring them out of the house because you've discovered them and you take them out to the world. That is who you are. That is who we are. That's who Yeshua HaMashiach Adonai is. And that's what he says about you. Bow your heads with me.
Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. wanted to experience deep and glorious truths in God's Word, from Genesis to Revelation, as if you were actually there. In this incredibly unique book, Glimpses of Glory, from longtime pastor, media personality, and internationally acclaimed best-selling author Carl Gallup's, God's love for you will come alive as you walk directly into the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve encountered the great tempter. You'll be placed inside the ark, experiencing the horror of Noah's family as they heard the agonizing cries of their neighbors, struggling in vain to survive the deluge, and the anguish of our Savior will explode into intense reality as you witness His struggle with human emotion on the night He was betrayed. But that's just the beginning. In Glimpses of Glory, you will accompany Joseph and Mary on the arduous journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem's manger and beyond. Be present at the working of Jesus' miracles, His baptism, and labor during the wilderness temptation. Stand in shock at the foot of the cross. Linger at the deathbed of John the disciple and witness His entrance into final glory and so much more. So take a personal journey with the Savior from Genesis to Revelation. Available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985.